Welcome to Future Squared, the podcast all about corporate innovation and entrepreneurship. My name is Steve Glaveski and each week I'll bring you authors, corporate innovation managers, entrepreneurs and above all else, thought leaders on the topics of innovation, entrepreneurship and self-improvement. Future Squared brings you a double dose of innovation inspiration every week to help you successfully navigate your innovation journey. Every Monday, I'll bring you a world-class thought leader such as Steve Blank, Alex Osterwalder, Neil Patel, Rand Fishkin, or Whitney Johnson, just to name a few. While every Friday, I'll bring you some quick digestible insights myself to help end your week on a high before you head off for the weekend. Future Squared is proudly brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation hub, school, and consultancy that works with large organizations to help them adopt the mindset, methodologies, and tools required to explore new business models and disruptive innovation in an era of rapid change. If your organization needs support coming up with ideas, testing and turning those ideas into reality, incubating teams, driving cultural change, or connecting and partnering with startups, then visit Collective Campus online at www.collectivecamp.us. And without further ado, here's today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Square. Today I'll be speaking with Ryan Blair. He's a serial entrepreneur and self-made millionaire who had nothing to lose and everything to gain. At just 21 years old, Blair founded his first company, 24-7 Tech, and by the age of 34, he has founded and sold numerous businesses for hundreds of millions of dollars. In August 2011, Blair authored the New York Times bestseller, Nothing to Lose and Everything to Gain, How I Went from Gang Member to Multimillionaire Entrepreneur. Uncensored and raw in his account of growing up in the face of adversity, Blair effectively imparts lessons learned from obstacles faced and provides a roadmap for entrepreneurial success. Blair's no ordinary businessman. He's a master of personal reinvention. His biggest endeavor yet has been the overhaul of Vaisalis Sciences, a company that manufactures weight loss and nutritional supplement products. Blair originally sold the company, but within just a few months, due to the recession, Vaisalis was within one month from having to declare bankruptcy. As CEO, Blair went all in personally investing his last million dollars on a new business model that would later revolutionize the $118 billion direct selling industry. In just 21 months, Vaisalis went from $600,000 to $30 million in monthly sales and is still climbing. Blair regularly appears as a business expert on national television networks such as CNBC, MSNBC, and Fox. He has also been featured in major publications including Fortune Magazine, Business Week, Forbes Magazine, and The Wall Street Journal. Blair is also a contributor for the Financial Times and took a turn in movie production, serving as executive producer of Man in the Glass, the Dale Brown story, an award-winning documentary about the legendary LSU basketball coach. Blair's captivating story was also a bestseller in USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, and Inc. Magazine, amongst others. Through a candid and unfiltered voice, Nothing to Lose speaks to everyone, from struggling youth to thriving businessmen alike, illustrating how to turn failures into successes. So with that, it gives me much pleasure to introduce you to the one, the only, Ryan Blair. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Thank you for having me, Steve. No, man, it's an absolute pleasure. I have uh, had the the privilege, I guess we'll call it a privilege, of listening to you speak to guys like your good friend Lewis Howes and the School of Greatness and a few other podcasts, and I yeah. know our listeners are going to get a lot of value bombs out of today's chat. Cool, cool. Well, yeah, Lewis is a great friend of mine, and you know, I, I just I just love being able to give back. I'm a teacher, you know, first and foremost, and I guess, well, more, I'm a student, and I just love to teach what I've learned, whether it be, you know, through the mentors in my life or, you know, through experience. Yeah, well, that's what it's all about. You know, life is a journey of constantly learning, and uh, that's exactly why this podcast exists. So, I mean, I was super excited to chat with you today. Um, bit of context, I'm 33 now, but when I was 21, a few friends chipped in to buy me a tattoo. And oh, really? I was like, what kind of tattoo do I get? So, after some umming and ahhing, I got a tattoo of a king of spades. Not because I'm a poker shark, but because if you look into the history behind the kings in a pack of cards, they all represent yep. historical figures. And the king of spades was David uh, from David and ah. Goliath, right? So it's yep. all about triumph over adversity. And um, your second book, Rock Bottom to Rock Star, is essentially all about triumphing over adversity, going from rags to riches. So how about, yes, um, for the benefit of an audience who might not know who you are, uh, filling us in on a little bit about your background and how the book, uh, or what inspired the book? Well, you know, yeah, so I, I appreciate that. And in fact, I, I recently went to uh, Israel 
uh, and mm-hmm. on a bit of a pilgrimage to study New Testament, Old Testament, all religions wow. I could, because I, I just love studying, you know, spirituality and trying to understand how humanity operates. And I, I, I got the story. I went to David's tomb and uh, uh, dove deeply into exactly the way he operated and his background and so forth. So I, I think that's an awesome uh, icon. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. if the tattoo has symbolism, amazing. I've got tattoos all over me. Most of them are cover-ups. Uh-huh. And the reason, the reason why they're cover-ups is because I used to be in a gang uh-huh. uh, as a kid. And for those people who know, my first book was called Nothing to Lose, Everything to Gain, How I Went from Gang Member to Multimillionaire. Mm. It, um, it's been uh, published all around the world and done quite well. So I'm blessed to have that. Uh, the book that I wrote uh, that just came out that you just mentioned, Rock Bottom to Rockstar, Lessons from the Business School of Hard Knocks, mm-hmm. is a follow-up to that. My story is real simple, uh, but I guess in its simplicity, there's a lot of complexity. Um, uh, I was raised by an engineer. My father was in the aerospace industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, prior to that, he was, in, uh, he was a Vietnam vet, and he suffered from a lot of um, PTSD and uh, was a very violent individual. Yeah. Uh, he then got addicted to drugs. When I say violence, a lot of times people are like, oh, you know, uh, you got spanked. That's not what my dad did. My dad did terrible, violent things to my mother, to my brothers, to my sisters. <clears throat> And they even got it worse than me because I was so young that I had yet to get, you know, the real, the real, um, uh, you know, evil that he yeah. would be able to deliver upon his family. Um, but I guess gratefully, uh, he got addicted to drugs and I went to social services uh, in my eighth grade year. Well, I actually went to the principal. They said, this, this has got to stop. They were calling the police immediately. My dad fled and I never saw him again. Wow. Now, he's still alive and every once in a while he'll chime in on Facebook and Ask me how I'm doing, and I've forgiven him, and you know uh, I haven't yet seen him, but I plan to at some point. But he disappeared. My family disintegrated. My brothers and sisters all went to jail, and I went from a middle class environment, uh, you know, with the dad who was an engineer that was successful in comparison to you know most, mm. um, and it certainly in you know in those days. And you know we had the pool, we had the new presents under the Christmas tree. Mm-hmm. Every new school year, I got new clothes. Uh, I played in, uh, I played in baseball. I played in basketball. I played in soccer. Yeah. You know, um, dad would show up to the games on Saturday to watch me play. Mm. Uh, I was competitively driven because he, inst- he made sure like, like we look at my batting averages. We'd look at how many bases I stole. We'd look at, <laughs> you know, my performance and he would give me incentives, you know, to, to do better and get better. And, and, you know, and he was, I got to give him credit for that because yeah. he created a, a competitor but then, unfortunately, when he disappeared at 13, I got involved in a gang. Uh, I got caught up with a round crowd. My sister is still involved with this, this crowd to this day. And uh, her best friend, Jennifer Jordan, was murdered in a drive-by shooting. Jer- Jennifer was my first kiss, my first crush. Mm. And um, wow. next thing you know, I'm forced into a gang. I didn't elect to be in one. I was forced into one. And what they do to young kids, uh, once they, you know they get you know, they, they get influence over you is they order you to do anything, everything they don't want to do. Mm. And so that's, that's what happened to me. So that was, uh, my years 13 through <laughs> about 17. Wow. Um, yeah. And, but I, the irony of it was, is, uh, and this actually happened as a result. And I don't think I've even mentioned this recently, but as a result of my dad's, uh, you know, violence, uh, I started screwing off in school mm. and I knew like if I brought home uh, D's, F's, and C's, I'd get my ass whooped, like bad. Like, I'm talking like, so I'd do anything I could to prevent that. And the first actual time I ever worked on a, touched a computer was, I knew it was going to be a beating because I had not been paying attention in school. Mm. I have ADD, as you'll see in this interview. I'm <laughs> dyslexic. Uh, uh, you know, I, I believe I passed down some of those traits to my son, yeah. Reagan, who has autism, right? So, um, uh, but I got on a computer and I remember it was this old dot matrix printer and I recreated my report card. I reverse engin- engineered into a successful grade point average. <laughs> um, I, you know, and I, I waited for the mail to arrive, you know, for days. I found the exact um, letter, you know, that they send with the report card in it. I steamed it open and I inserted my uh, repaired credit, <laughs> my repaired GPA and uh, presented it to my dad and he opens it and he's like, wow great grades. Yeah. And like I avoided a butt kicking. And so as a result of that, I became fascinated with computers. Mm-hmm. And then when I was in a gang, that's all I did was I stole computers, which yeah. I learned how to reprogram them. I learned how to, you know, uh, uh, you know, build them and take them apart. I learned all that stuff. 
That's interesting. Uh, by, yeah, by luck. Um, yeah, kind of like the unintended yeah. consequences of uh, negative reinforcement. Yeah, well, you know, I believe everything happens for a reason. Uh, you know, I believe that I was, I was, you know, I'm blessed to have been given a set of obstacles during a period of time mm. when there was huge opportunity, you know, and there still is huge opportunity now. People just tend to see their opt- obstacles. They don't see their opportunities. Yeah. So I was like, I, anyway, so I, I learned computers early and this is a late 90, mid 90s. And by the late 90s, I'd found a mentor when I was about 17 years old mm-hmm. by, through my mother's um, my mother had met a guy. She used to work at a deli making sandwiches for people. And my mother had met him and he took an interest in her. And then she said, hey, you need to talk to my son because she was afraid I was going to wind up like my uh, brothers and sisters mm-hmm. dead or in prison. And a lot of my friends I grew up with, they're still in prison now. Right. Yeah. So, you know, no, my, my mom did not want to see her son go down the path that her other children did. And um, and the kids in my neighborhood were going down. Mm-hmm. So she got me a mentor. And that was his name was Robert Hunt. Uh, he later became my stepfather. He's he's passed away in, uh, not too long ago in 2010 mm-hmm. um, with uh, lung cancer, and it was unexpected. Wow. And uh, it it really inspired me to write Nothing to Lose, and it really it really inspired me to be the man I am today because I had been successful by that time. I'd started I started uh, my first company. Well, I start I, I became an engineer myself, uh, working for a company called Logix mm-hmm. uh, in 19. 19- 98, uh, no, 1996 through 99. Uh, after I saw Logix developing software for the gaming industry, I decided I was going to break off on my own mm-hmm. and build my own company. My first company was called 24 seven tech, uh, which was, you know, I, I learned a lot from it. Didn't make much money, actually lost money, wow. but I learned, you know, what not to do. Mm. Um, and I'll tell you, I'm 20 years into my career as an entrepreneur. I have a long list of things that you shouldn't do that, I, that I've learned the hard way. <laughs> uh, and over the next 20 years, I'll probably learn another thousand lessons. You know, is, and, is buying a private jet on that list? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more about that. But, uh, you know, access and nothing to lose. I have a chapter called Tap Those Assets. And, and it's funny because it's really easy to have these values, like tap those assets. And one of them is access to one of the principles of tapping those assets. The mm-hmm. chapter is access to is better than ownership of. Mm. I should have just used somebody else's jet. I didn't need to buy my own, yeah. uh, right? You know, like the maintenance fees, the repositioning fees. Mm-hmm. I had a Challenger 300, you know, it's a $30 million plane. And here I am not using it. And I'm burning cash, the assets depreciating. And, you know, and I'm sitting here now a little bit older with clarity that I don't need to have a plane on the, the, the yeah. runway at all times to feel gratified. And with the sharing economy now, mm-hmm. you have a number of new startups like Jets, uh, Jet Smarter, Jet Suite and a variety of others that, mm-hmm. that can give you private uh, plane access without having to pay for the plane. Yeah. So, well, it's like yeah. that old adage that the happiest day in a man's life is the day yeah. he buys a boat and the day he sells the boat. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I know that adage well. When, when you start coming into extreme wealth, you know, in 2012, mm. I sold my company at $792.4 million transaction. And, you know, wealth changes you. And, mm. you know, some, it doesn't change everybody, but it certainly changes poor kids they came from nothing uh, a lot of times anyways. And, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, I could tell you, it didn't change him. Uh, and, and God bless him. He stayed very, very true to himself and focused. Uh, I had to shed, I had to learn some lessons to get to the point where I'm now. And I was going to call Rock Bottom to Rockstar everything to lose, you know, as a mm. follow-up to nothing to lose. Yeah. But then I thought, you know, how many people actually identify with having everything to lose? Mm. Uh, mm. So, but yeah, I, I do know what that's like, the complexities that happen as a result of having wealth is just tremendous. And it's, you know, everybody dreams of having it and I'd rather have it than not have it. But boy, boy, do things get complicated. You know, you get lawsuits, you get people trying to steal from you, you get people lying to you, misappropriating your money, uh, you know, yeah. uh, you, utilizing your homes when you're on vacation and you find out that they're having a party at it or, you know, yeah. like all kinds of things happen with the more assets you, you, you create. And the more complexity you create in your life. And so now I just crave simplicity. Yeah. Well, it's, it's an interesting point because, I mean, you, you mentioned that growing up, uh, you became very competitive and you credit your dad for instilling that competitive nature in you. Um, yep. You know, you joined a gang and therefore coming from that environment and then after much hard work, finding extreme wealth, it's very easy to just you know, let your ego take you away and become an absolutely yeah. – horrible person but it sounds like you're extremely 
um, humble. Um, so, I mean, at what point did you kind of go off on that different trajectory and become the humble yeah. person you are today? Yeah, well, for one, don't ever trust a person who says that they're humble. <laughs> 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 I, so I, try, I do my best to be humble. I appreciate that, that, that acknowledgement. Uh-huh. Um, there are times where, you know, being humble comes with uh, self-esteem. Mm. So, that, I mean, basically, what's the opposite of humble? High ego. Yeah. Where's high ego come from? Insecurity. You know, low self-esteem, yeah. insecurity, right? Um, now insecurity can be magical. It can drive you, mm. you know, you want to prove that you're enough. You want to prove yourself. You want to prove your boss wrong. You want to prove your, you know, your company wrong, your family mm. wrong, the industry wrong. You know, that, that can be great as a driver. Mm-hmm. And that's a lot of ego driving you. Insecurity also can be a great driver. Like you want to save up enough money to make sure that your kids are taken care of. Uh, if you were to pass away, that's an insecurity yeah. that is, you know, rightful. Right? I have that same insecurity. Like I want to make sure that my son's taken care of if, God forbid, mm. you know, something happens to me. And with a son with autism, you know, I got to make sure that I have a plan for him long after I'm gone, right? In yeah. the event that, you know. So those are, those are lever points. Those are, you know, those are points that we all have within us. The key is to grow through them, but to utilize them, you know, as some sort of driving force, whether it's insecurity or ego or the desire for security, mm. Right. You know, now to get to true humility, you have to, particularly in business, you have to be humbled. And the things that humble you, you know, are I've had I've had this happen to me when I sold Sky Pipeline at 25 years old. Mm-hmm. I thought I was God's gift to the planet. I sold it <laughs> a 25 million dollar transaction. Uh, you know, it was on paper, so I didn't get that in cash. In fact, the venture capitalist got most of it. Mm-hmm. But I had these huge credentials and a big ego, and you know, and, and next thing you know, I'm blowing all my money. You know, I'm spending money on bottle service and going to nightclubs and yeah. being an idiot and I go bankrupt and that bankruptcy humbled me. Right. Mm. It, it, it was such a shameful thing for me. It hurt me so deeply. Mm. I got made fun of credit, credit creditors calling me all the time. My, even my, my stepfather was pissed at me. He was like, you live beyond your means. It goes against his value system. Yeah. You know what, you know what I mean? Like I had to be humbled. And now the reason why I share that, that story and I write about these stories is because you know, being humbled, you know, failure is actually the most important ingredient to, to success. Mm-hmm. There's nothing else that matters. It's how many times you failed, how much you've learned from those failures, how fast you got back up from them, and the actions you took as a result of them that changes you um, as an individual, both in values and ethics and otherwise. Yeah. And, and I guess, I mean, a little bit of ego can go a long way. And every successful yeah. entrepreneur, while they like to say, look, ego is the enemy and, you know, that's... <laughs> You need to put that aside. Ultimately, there is a little bit of ego that pushes people forward. We all want to do great things and, and drive yeah. forward. Um, but there is a lot of value in trying to stay humbled. So yeah, I, mean, sure. I know you are, you live up on the Hollywood Hills. You drive a Ferrari. How? <laughs> I mean, is there anything you do to try and find that, uh, to try and stay humbled, um, not only for yourself, but also for yeah. your 11-year-old boy, Reagan? Yeah, so, yeah, Reagan's seven. But so I'll tell you, oh, I, 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 yeah, I started reading, reading him the book, Steve, The Monk who sold his Ferrari. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of you familiar with autism, it's a disorder that that, uh, affects communication. My, a lot of autistic kids, like my son, they also have, uh, uh, dyslexia, which Mm -hmm. affects his ability to read. And so I, I read to him all the time. In fact, he's in the room next to me with a trained tutor as we speak. I just picked him up from school. That's, you know, we're basically attacking this problem, uh, as though it's life and death because I was a special needs kid. I was held back in second grade. Mm. I know what it's like to, to be lost in class, to be made fun of, to be you know, ridiculed because I couldn't, I couldn't read what the teacher was writing on the chalkboard, yeah. right? Um, so you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm blessed to have endured that so I can help my son through it. But I'll go back to the monk who sold his Ferrari. Mm-hmm. So I have a Ferrari, yes. Now, I earned my Ferrari. Yes. Next to my Ferrari is a 1964 Lincoln Continental, black on black on black Ooh. with suicide doors. Nice. It's my favorite car. Rebuilt it. Love this car. Mm-hmm. Uh, Reagan got attached to the Ferrari. And I was like, you know, it's cool. Like, I'm, I'm, I think that's awesome. You know, he thinks dad's cool. Yeah. Reagan's friends are like, wow, you have a Ferrari when they come over. Yeah, you know, I, I'm proud of myself. I've worked hard, hard. I pay cash for all this stuff, houses, mm-hmm. all that stuff. But then one day Reagan said, dad, will you take me to school in the Ferrari? <laughs> and I thought to myself, why would I do that? Like, why, you know, what's, what's, what, why not take the other car? Mm. I have, you know, a few cars. And, and he goes, well, no, I, I, want, I, want the, I want my friends to see you drop me off in the Ferrari. And then I thought, uh-oh, I'm creating a little issue here. Mm-hmm. He didn't earn that Ferrari. 
those friends should not take – he should not be deemed more successful because his dad has a Ferrari. He should be deemed more successful because he you know, earned a Ferrari mm-hmm. uh, or because he's accelerating in class or sports. And so I bought the book, The Monkey Sold His Ferrari, and uh, I made the decision that I will sell my Ferrari so my son does not get attached to that materialism that he did not earn. Uh, so I guess that would show that would share with you a long story about what is what has changed. You know, when you have a little boy watching you and modeling you, mm. he doesn't know that, you know, he sees the way people react to me when they read my books or if somebody asks me for an autograph or something or whatever on the rare occasion that someone even recognizes me. And he goes, Dad, what does that mean? Dad, what does it mean to have a Ferrari? And what I'm trying to teach my son is money means nothing. It is the value of the object to the individual that means something. Mm. Right. Mm. So, you know, it's the value of it, not the money, because money is just energy. Yeah. And it's, you know, and so a lot of people get confused. They chase money. What they should be chasing is value. How much Mm. value can I create? How much value can I give? And as a result of that, they get money. Yeah, definitely. And I guess that's an interesting segue into uh, the work you're doing with Vicellus. Vi- 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 um, yeah. I mean, ultimately, would you say, given the nature of the work, which is all about nutrition and helping people live better uh, lives, whether it's uh, physically, mentally, yeah. I know you have products that are help people focus at work. Um, yeah. I mean, is the fact that there's this, this purpose behind what you do, does that keep driving you? Because you're creating value for so many people rather than yeah. just like so many entrepreneurs out there just want to go out and build a billion dollar business purely to build a billion dollar business, but not really create that impact and value for the world. Yeah. You know, I, I have built a billion dollar business and, and it's not easy to do. Mm. And you're going to have a lot of times where you're like, man, I don't want to do this. Uh, I, you know, we, we, I used to be a, 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 an officer of a publicly traded company called Blythe, NYSEBTH. Mm-hmm. I've been through the scrutiny of short sellers. We we're the number one most shorted stock in all of Wall Street. Wow. And <laughs> yours truly led their profit engine and their revenue engine. Uh-huh. And they were the private eyes were in my freaking trash cans Jeez. trying to find out find reasons to short the stock. Right. Mm-hmm. Like I, I got to tell you, I've, I've, I've dealt I've been at all levels. I have friends that are multibillionaires. You know, I've been pr- privileged to be mentored by a number of great human beings. That have, you know, they're some of the most influential uh, people in the world, both in politics and in capitalism. Mm. Uh, capitalism. And I got to share with you, you know, the, the thing is, is nobody ever creates anything that's worth many billions of dollars unless it is so ego driven mm. or so or so value driven. Yeah. But you can't be somewhere in between. Either be the biggest ego in the world mm-hmm. and, you know, and. God bless him. Be like Donald Trump and just think you're God's gift to humanity and you know everything. And you're the best businessman. Nothing you do is wrong and you'll go create a lot of value. Yeah. And that's one cha- That's one path. That's not my path. <laughs> you'll create a lot of value for yourself basically at many times at the expense of a lot of other people. Mm. It remains to be seen what he'll do in politics. I, I'm not voting either. I'm not specifying you know, what I think I think what I think is going to happen. But I can mm. tell you that his path to success was all about him yeah. and all about you know him doing whatever the hell he wanted to do, and he did it. Yeah. Uh, my path to success is all about other people. Mm. Right? Yeah, it's about exactly getting, right. uh, yeah, yeah, helping people be wealthy, helping my internal team members make millions, helping my customers lose weight, uh, you know, giving, helping my customers have fun or make a little bit of extra income to the Vicel's business model to pay for a vacation. So I'm more about other people, mm. uh, and and the only reason why is because I was. Uh, as a kid, I was always told, give and then you receive. Mm. And my grandmother, a very spiritual woman, she would always say, Ryan, the more that you this more that you sow, the more that you'll reap, the more that you give, the more that you receive. If you tithe, you get tenfold. And so I'd always just I always thought that was the only economic principle that worked. Yeah. And that's it's worked for me. Yeah, definitely. It, it's um, it reminds me of um Zig Ziglar and, and guys like Peter Diamandis who say things like, "Well, if you want to make a billion dollars, help a billion people. Um, if yep. you if you want uh, to get things in return, you've got to do things for other people. Help people get what they want in order to help get what you want." Um, yeah, it it, it's abstract though. Up. It's abstract though. It's very tough to. Mm. It's abstract and it's not it's not immediate. Yeah. And so right now, like you know, the other night. Um, and I, I uh, in 2007, uh, right when I was starting my sales, and I, I was, I was recovering from my uh, bankruptcy, mm. but I wasn't yet, you know, wealthy. And these, this part of my team, um, two two women, actually a mother and two of her daughters, were killed in a murder suicide. Wow. Uh, uh, and you know, I, I basically raised enough money to bury the family and chipped in a significant sum myself. Mm-hmm. 
And I did so without any desire of, you know, accolades or didn't put a press release out. Mm -hmm. I just sent the money to the family, you know, devastated that these two, you know, wonderful little girls that were, you know, fans of ours had, had tragically been murdered. And, you know, and it really impacted me greatly. And just the other day, uh, you know, almost 10 years later, one of the family members writes me and says, you know, my family prays for you all the time. Mm -hmm. We thank you. We know you're a generous individual. And, you know, and, and, you know, and, and we'll never forget what you did for our family. Yeah. And so I, I didn't get, I didn't get repayment for what I put in, nah. but I'll tell you, man, that charged me up that day. And I thought to myself, huh, like 10 years ago, I, or almost 10 years ago, I did something that was positive. It was good. Mm. And now I got to feel that 10 years later, mm. what type of ripple effect am I creating now that I'm going to feel 10 years from now yeah. or 20 years from now? Yeah. And that's the moral of the stories. People just don't realize like, you know, you, they, they think they should get immediate returns on giving of time and of energy and of service. And mm -hmm. it's not the case. You get sometimes you get it immediately and sometimes you get it 10 years from now and sometimes you never get it. But mm -hmm. you just keep doing that and you'll become successful. Yeah. And, and I guess defining what success means to you is also a big part of it. I mean, of course, financial success and wealth is one part of it. But yeah. another part of it is actually just creating that impact on other people's lives and making their lives better, like like that story you just told. It's not necessarily yeah. about direct financial returns. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that, that family that I helped bury, for example, mm. I'm sure that when somebody says, oh, I'm trying Vicellus, I'm sure they're like, that's a great company. Sometimes you create goodwill on this planet and that that you know that that's a very important aspect of your future dealings as a business person right you create goodwill Warren Buffett said you know he said the only thing that will ever fire a manager over is if they damage the, uh, the reputation of Berkshire Hathaway yeah right he's created such a reputation that he's able to get things at a great price and get great opportunities and he's able to you know to to perform astronomical you know returns for his investors over time because he makes sure that everything he does, uh, whether the company's you know having a tough time or accelerating, he preserves 100% you know his reputation at all times at the highest order. That's the highest you know principle that he has. Mm, yeah, definitely. And man, there's so many different ways we can take this conversation. Um, yeah. So many good stuff coming out. Um, but uh, one thing I wanted to touch on was the way you um, essentially turned around um, Blythe. Uh, yeah. you mentioned that earlier, you briefly touched on, uh, the company and obviously it was around 2008 where the company weathered the recession, almost went bankrupt. Do you want to pick up the story there? Yeah. You know, I could, I could tell you the story is, uh, pretty simple. So mm -hmm. I, Vaisalis was, you know, my, uh, my baby, mm -hmm. I'd sold it to Blythe in 2008. And as a result of selling it to Blythe, I had a five-year earnout. Yeah. Um, during that five-year earnout period, the uh, uh, you know, we, the Great Recession hit. My earnout was um, you know basically shut down, and as a result of that, you know I was left holding the bag, so to speak. Mm. So you know my um, my situation was pretty simple. Do I go? You know, do I do I start a new company? Mm -hmm. Do I start over? Um, you know, or do I stay with it? I had studied Steve Jobs, you know, inside and out. I saw the way he got uh, uh, fired from Apple. And decided that I was going to stick with it. Yep. And I let Blythe fire me. They basically hired a new CEO. Uh, they let me keep my official title, but they didn't pay me mm -hmm. uh, a dollar. And, uh, and I could show up to board meetings on my own dime uh, mm -hmm. after I invested back into the company the life savings that I'd had and the money that I was able to take out in 2008. But I, I swore that I would, uh, I would uh, uh, you know, stick with it because I'd made a promise to my promoters and to my customers and my employees and my, you know, my fiduciary responsibility mm -hmm. to my shareholders. And as a result of sticking with it and tearing apart my business model and working, you know, around the clock, I was able to get the biggest corporate earnout in the history of, of earnouts from zero to 792 million in a period of five years. And wow. that had never happened in the history of SEC filings. Uh, you know, in all across all public companies. Yeah, that's awesome. And, um, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you mentioned there Steve Jobs briefly, and I know you recently uh, wrote a blog post about yeah. how Steve Jobs helped you through your rock bottom moment, um, and how yeah. most people, whether they're entrepreneurs or just people struggling with life, can take a lot of lessons from Steve Jobs. So, do you want to perhaps just um, elaborate a little bit more on that point? Yeah. Well, I've never met Steve, right? But I, I, I've learned a lot about him. 
uh, you know, remotely. I've hired mm-hmm. some of his employees. You know, um, you know, Steve Steve Jobs is an interesting person. A lot, of the, you know, is controversial as well. A lot of people would say, mm-hmm. you know, he killed himself, right? But he, yeah. you know, I would tell you from what I know, he wanted to see his life's mission and goal was to see Apple be the most successful company it possibly could be, mm-hmm. and he achieved that, right? It was a, it's the number one market company by market cap, and it was at the time of his death, and. And he beat Microsoft and everybody else. Um, now, conversely, there are people out there that will tell you that they knew him as well. And, you know, he was sing- single-minded, laser-focused as an entrepreneur, and he didn't mm-hmm. care about what anyone else thought. He just cared about, relentlessly, he cared about their results. And, yeah. you know, there's balance there. But I've learned a lot from Steve, and I still continue to learn from him. In fact, I had Nolan Bushnell in my house uh, the other day, which is the founder of Atari. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was the one who discovered Steve. He also was a founder of Chuck E. Cheese and so forth. So, yeah. you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a student first and foremost. I want to learn from everyone. And one of the things that's, that's silly to me is how people refuse to learn from people. Mm. Like, you know, I have people criticize me and they'll say, oh, well, you got lucky. Or, oh, well, you know, you did this, you did that. It's like, don't you think you can learn from the perspective of a person, even if they did get lucky? And yeah. aren't we all lucky just yeah. to be alive? Yeah. Well, what's luck? Luck is the intersection of um, hard work and opportunity, or well, hard work and yeah, timing, absolutely. right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't just happen. I wake up this morning and hey, I, I IPO'd on the um, New York Stock Exchange, but obviously I put in years of hard work before that to get this company to product market fit and have lots of thousands or millions of people around the world that love our product and everything else and dealing with the ins and outs of building a company and people management and all the rest yep. of it. It doesn't just happen overnight. Yeah, no kidding. You, yeah. you have to learn it somewhere. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, yeah. Mm, um, it's, it's, uh, I, I got to tell you that we're all lucky to be alive in, in, in the time that we're alive right now. Um, you know, we have the deindustrialization of, you know, of, of our industrialized world mm-hmm. occurring right now. Yeah. Jobs are shifting. You know, uh, the world is becoming more transparent. There's better tools than ever to communicate, to reach out to mentors, to learn. You know, you have speeches for free on YouTube. You have, yeah. you have all kinds of different access to, to, to things you didn't have in the past. Oh yeah, it's the barriers to entry are so low. I mean, we we actually run a, a kids entrepreneurship program called Lemonade Stand, and we have kids as young as eight years old coming through. And in two days, we get them building, you know, websites. That's we awesome. get them using That's design awesome. thinking and lean startup philosophies to just build something, but then put it out there, like get yeah. generate some traffic, just to inspire the kids and just to empower them and show that hey, in today's environment, you can actually get someone from the other side of the world visiting your product, engaging with what you've just built yeah. in a matter of yeah. hours. Um, we yeah. didn't have that. Yeah, right. Accelerating. Yeah. yeah. No, not at all. It's, it's accelerating. Like some of the technologies, we, you know, I run a, a venture fund called Hashtag One. Mm-hmm. And the idea behind it is we want to be number one. And we're, we're working on some AI projects. And I got to tell you, I'm like, wow, yeah. we're going to change the way people think and the way people work and the way people learn. And we're going to adapt. The computer's going to adapt to them, to their, you know, to their speed of their, their cadence of their fingertips, mm-hmm. to, you know, how they touch, what they touch, when they touch it. There's there's stuff happening right now behind the scenes, you know, that that is just it's going to change very fast. The whole oh, yeah. world out, the whole world is going to change at a at a multiplication rate on a per year basis over the next ten to fifteen years, yeah. uh, and you're going to see just the whole world change. And yeah. so you either have to adapt that and get involved in that and embrace it, or mm-hmm. you, you might find yourself out of a job. You know, definitely. I'm super excited about the uh, I suppose the coalescence of AI with with the classroom. Um, yeah, I mean, you, mentioned, me you touched on it earlier. You know, you said yeah. you, you had ADD. Um, you struggled in class. You were held back in in the second grade. Yep. And that's because the classroom hasn't really changed since the dawn of the industrial age. You know, it's a teacher at the front of the room, twenty or thirty kids sitting there, trying to keep up at the same pace. But it's impossible. Whereas if you have AI yeah. that interacts with the person and adapts based on how that person interacts and how that person learns, then it's better yeah. learning outcomes for everyone. Yeah. And teaching the teacher how to teach. Right. So, well, like, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. So like, you know, like my son Reagan, all of a sudden is no longer a challenge in the classroom. You know, he's seen for his uniqueness, his strengths, his genius. In fact, the teacher could learn how to actually, you know, how to actually harness Reagan to teach other kids some of the things that, that he, that the other kids don't know. And next yeah. thing you know, you have community teaching. That's actually the project that I'm working on with Nolan right now mm-hmm. uh, is using, um, uh, adapt, you know, machine language, I'm sorry, machine learning to understand how to teach people. Right, right. That's 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 interesting. Um, I guess uh, I mean uh, on that. That's a great point because you're going to identify, for example, Reagan's strengths, and then he's going to be able to teach that back to the other children, which is a sense of validation as well. I mean, a lot of kids, we try and 
stick you know square pegs in round yep. holes right and then some kids get left behind they start to question themselves insecurities grow oh, i'm not good enough um the other kids are smarter than me i'm stupid but everybody's got their strengths and by identifying yep. those strengths and saying hey teach this person um we can help that child consolidate their skills but also improve their self-confidence it's gonna be well you know the, and the reason why i'm, I'm on this mission is because mm. i remember sitting in class as a kid mm. held back you know, and, and remember how much, how insecure I felt. And what happens when you're insecure is you gain attention, uh, you know, through, through bad means. So, yeah. you know, I'm not able to follow along in class. The teacher's not able to teach me because there's 28 other kids that can. And so what do I do? I try to distract the other kids. I try to yeah. get attention elsewhere. And what happens when I try to get that attention? I get negative reinforcement, mm -hmm. right? Not positive reinforcement. Right. And the more negative reinforcement I get, the less I do, the more I, you know, I, I, I you know, um, dig in, so to speak, and particularly a competitive male, right? So it's like you got to learn how to give them positive reinforcement in a way that helps them, you know, helps them develop their strengths. And then the key is to, to you know, work on your weaknesses or your not so strong strengths, mm. but work on them to the point where they just don't damage your self esteem because you're never going to be great. Like a lot of one of the, uh, my philosophies um, in dealing with partners and people and mm my executive teams is your efficacy and your self-esteem need to you know, be as close to matching as possible. Yeah. So if you have high self-esteem and low efficacy, I have no, I have no desire to work with you. Mm -hmm. Great. You know, you're out there, you think you're the best, but your work product is not. Yeah. So goodbye. Yeah. Or you have, you have high efficacy. Your work product is amazing, but you know, you won't speak up for yourself. You won't say, I disagree with your opinion. Mm. You won't say, Hey, this, the company's going down the wrong path. I know it. I've seen it before because your self-esteem doesn't allow you to talk in the room. Yeah. Then, you know, then good riddance. You know, I, I can't deal with that. But your self-esteem and your efficacy are always changing. They're never completely, you know, locked in parallel because as you grow as a human being, so does your efficacy. But then so needs to be your self-esteem. And that's the same for a child that it is for me right now. My mm. efficacy is growing substantially right now and my self-esteem is on pace with it. Yeah. But you got to always check the way you keep your self-esteem growing you know, for me anyways, is personal growth, listening to podcasts, just like yours, Steve, mm. reading great books, you know, and, and if you have money, go attend their events. I've gone to Tony Robbins events. I've gone to, you know, seminars. I've gone to charity events. I'm constantly putting myself in position to learn because the more you learn, the greater your self-esteem will be, especially if you apply those learnings to improve your efficacy, to improve your skills, to improve your daily actions. Yeah. And it's about what we touched on earlier about finding that ground that middle ground between you know huge ego and insecurity um and i yeah. know you've talked about people you wish people would ask more questions and i think yeah. oftentimes people have these big egos or, and they're scared that if they ask the wrong question or in their mind what is the wrong question it's going to make them look stupid but there is no wrong yeah. question if you don't know yeah. the answer then by not asking the question you're just going to stay where you are yeah yeah you gotta you know one one thing though i will tell you is mm -hmm. You know, one, you got to ask a lot of great questions. Um, I remember being in, in uh, early on in my career in the software uh, industry. I remember walking up to one of the leaders and there was a modem and the, uh, we we're having a communication issue. And this is the day of the modem. <laughs> and I walk up to the guy and I say, uh, you know, uh, do you think it's a modem down? And he walks over, he looks at it and he looks at me and he goes, did you look at the modem before you asked me that question? Mm. And I go, no. And he goes, come over here. And he drags me over to the modem and he points to the lights and he says, of course it's down. Why would you ask me that question, right? Yeah. So I share that with you because uh, I learned that lesson powerfully. It's like you need to ask the question and don't ask questions that you can find out the answer otherwise, right? Because no one wants their time wasted. So like if a person, for example, I get these direct messages, I read them all. I don't have time to reply to them, but they're like, you know, they're like, I want to start a business. What do I do? Mm. And I'm like, well, you know, I got a book. I've got a yeah. hundred videos on YouTube on the subject. <laughs> you know, you could, if you just ask the question of like, Hey Ryan, in this particular circumstance, you know, you said you did this. I'd like to know what I should do here. Uh, then I'm going to answer the question because I have some context and I know that you've actually done some homework and you're not just asking me a question because it's simpler to ask a question than it's actually do your homework on what the answer is. Right. Mm. So mm. I'm not going to go to Bill Gates and say, Hey, you know, what do you think about the malaria vaccine? Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm going to be like, Hey, uh, you know, here's some particular knowledge that I have on the subject. And I'd like to talk to you about your, uh, specific, uh, information you know, or, or experience or knowledge or otherwise. And then he answers the question to me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, but a lot of times people just don't do their homework. 
They asked questions that they could find the answer, answer to otherwise. Mm. And as a result of that, they waste people's time. Yeah. So you got to be careful about that. Yeah. I, absolutely. I mean, I, I, yeah. Sorry. Go for it. Yeah. I, I was having dinner with Robert Kennedy uh, this weekend. And I'm not a name dropper. I just, you know, I'm not a Kennedy either. Mm -hmm. And I never thought I'd ever be with a Kennedy. And I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm holding back questions about how their family works or about – the Kennedy Library and all that mm. stuff because I'm like, why would I ask these questions? I can find that out else, you know, otherwise. He's probably been asked those questions a hundred times. If I go do some research and then I still have the question, then I should ask him the question at dinner, right? Yeah. But otherwise, there's stuff that I want to talk about and I'm sure he wants to talk about that hasn't been asked before, right? Mm. Mm. Or, or the, you know, questions that haven't been answered anyways. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I guess that kind of um, aligns with what you're a big believer in, which is mastering a process first then handing it over. Um, especially if you yeah, if you're building a company, you can't just delegate things. And if you're just delegating from day one, you're not going to know how the inner trappings of your organization work. And you're, you're not going to know what the best way to do things is unless you spend that time up front to really get comfortable with the process before you hand it yep. over. Yeah, yeah, you have to. I tell, like, in, in Rock Bottom to Rockstar, I say, like, you can't outsource your problems. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I've invested in maybe 20 portfolio companies, and a number of them have sales challenges, right? Mm hmm. And the last thing in the world, everybody's like, hey, can we just outsource sales? And, you know, yeah, that'd be great. If you could just outsource your revenue creation, that'd be, uh, uh, that'd be the yeah. easiest thing in the world. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Um, I mean, we, I've, I've got a pet peeve with a lot of marketing agencies and sales, outs, uh, inside yeah. sales firms who say, oh, we'll just, you know, 10x your revenue. And you get them on board. And, you know, what? They might be awesome at just execution. But when it comes to the strategy and thinking about yeah. – who is your customer? What drives your customer? How do we really appeal to this customer? What words do we use? What images do we use? And so on. It's not there. And the, the only yeah, person well, that's going to know if it answers, was, yeah. yeah, if it was, they're making a billion dollars doing that somewhere else. They don't have time for you. <laughs> you exactly. know what I mean? Like if, if sales were that easy, uh, you can't out, like, like I, I, I always uh, laugh at my team. I'm like, like we have a big DR uh, and behavioral, uh, uh, you know, uh, sales optimization process in one of our firms. And I'm sitting there saying, look, if the people that you wanted to do this job were available, they already are doing it as entrepreneurs and making a billion dollars a year doing it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't right. Agree so like, there, you know, there's, you gotta, you gotta master the process. Then you gotta hire people to execute on the process, develop those people, and then, you know, refine the process. Uh, but as an entrepreneur, you're not going to just outsource. Like I had to learn the fundamentals of finance and accounting. I couldn't just be like, hey, uh, you know, I just trust you guys to do all my finance and accounting so I could just do sales. Yeah. I wouldn't have been able to, you know, to, to basically reverse engineer the, large, the, you know, the biggest buyout in corporate America history from zero to, to X yeah. had I not mastered the principles of finance. Or not, I won't say mastered, but understood deeply mm -hmm. the principles of finance, deeply the principles of, of corporate uh, and securities law, mm -hmm. and, you know, and got to the place where I got to. And then I got to say, I had a great team that, you know, that, that basically advised me and helped me get there by all means. But I had to understand deeply those two principles mm. in order for me to engineer the outcome that I had. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I mean, it, it reminds me of a story. Well, just a quick tidbit on, uh, some Facebook ads that we had outsourced to a, to a company to promote one of our products. Yeah. We'd been running these campaigns for a few months and the best cost per click we got was something like $2.50. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to spend some time educating myself on this. Within a day, um, I ran some what's known as, uh, you'd be familiar with it, lookalike ads. And that cost per click was like 27 cents. And the people that I would get, was getting to our website was way more targeted and way higher, way yeah. more likely to convert. And it's like, where was this the whole time? Why, weren't, yeah. why wasn't this agency asking me these questions? And it goes back to what you were saying was, if they had the answers or if they had the capability, they would have done it themselves. Yeah, you know, you know, it, it is, it, it's, it's a hundred percent that, and you got to look at how their compensation is. Mm. Their compensation is derived off the amount of money you spend on it per ad basis, right? Yeah. In those firms, so they're making, they want, they want you to spend as much money as possible, mm -hmm. and they want to give you the minimum result to keep you as a client. Yeah. That's the, that's the way a lot of service providers are. And mm. you know, I've had publicity firms I've hired, and all they try to do is, 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 you know, in essence, give you. Um, you know, is, is as little service as possible to keep you as a customer. And then they just try to sell you to stay on as a customer day in and day out. And, you know, and, and I've had to, you know, get rid of more service providers than you can imagine 
because you know their claims don't match their results. Yeah, yeah. Or you might have a PR company that gets you like one article in a whole yeah. year, and it's like, well, that article got you more money than what you pay us. So yeah, what's the problem? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's there's a the value exchange situation is interesting. Now there's some service providers that are the exact opposite of that. Mm. I, I'm, I'm privileged to have found those, but it's, they're kissing a lot of frogs. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, look, man, uh, there's a lot of cool insights coming out of this podcast. But what would be, say, awesome. your top three pieces of um, career advice for, I guess, if, let me just think of a sort of a, a customer arch- archetype in our audience, which would be people yeah. who, say, are working for the man, they're working in a large organization, big bank, they've been there for, say, five to ten years, they see all the change of foot in the economy, they're like, well, I want to go out there and do my own thing or create some real impact in the world. What advice do you have for people like that? Um, you know, well, I guess, for one, um, I, a lot of people think as an entrepreneur, that I, I tell everybody, quit and be entrepreneurs. That's, yeah. that's not the case mm. because I have to have a lot of employees mm-hmm. that work for my portfolio of companies. And the way I retain them is I seek entrepreneurial employees. I seek employee team members. They're going to you know, be resourceful. They're going to bring new ideas to the table. They're going to learn outside of work. They're not going to charge me for their learning, right? Like I love it when a, you know, a team member comes to me and says, Ryan, I went to a seminar or I read this book. And they did so independent of me to skill themselves up, to cr- increase the value that they offer. And I always give people, you know, uh, I'm always generous with people that, you know, increase their value without having me to pay for it. Yeah. Right. Like a lot of times employees are always like, what can you give to me? What can you give to me? <laughs> what I was told by my mentor, uh, Robert Hunt, was do more than what you're paid for. And then eventually I'll pay you more. But until then, I'm only paying you what you're making. So after, since I've said that, now I did leave corporate America. It wasn't a big company, Logix. I saved up six months uh, worth of my uh, necessary living means. Mm-hmm. Now, as an entrepreneur, you don't pay the same taxes as employees. You get to write off a lot more uh, of related items for your work expenses. And so I got six months in the bank, and I worked on my business at night mm-hmm. after work. Now, I work 10, 12-hour days, and I take four hours to six hours every night. Yeah. I'd allocate it to business. And I'd sleep four to five hours, make up for it on some of the weekends, mm-hmm. and I grinded. And I did that mm-hmm. for, you know, you got to get your 10,000 hours in as an entrepreneur before you can become a pro. Mm-hmm. Now, being a pro just means that you're, recover, you're, you're paying yourself the, the wages you need to live. It doesn't mean you're making billions. Yep. The way that I've made, you know, lots of money, a lot more than pro level, is I put in over 100,000 hours into my entrepreneurial career as I, as I stand here talking to you right now, mm. now I'm 39. I got, you know, God willing, 40 more years left of work in me, right? Mm-hmm. So how many hours will I have at the end of my career? You know, at least two, three, four hundred thousand 400,000 more hours focused, though, doing the things that I love to do, building great companies, you know, working with great people. But until you get your 10,000 hours in, you know, you're, you're, you, you got I would do whatever I could to get my 10,000 hours in as fast as I possibly could. And I would take all time away from extracurricular activities other than that, which fulfills me or provides for my family. Yeah. But watching that, watching NASCAR all day long on Sunday or going to all kinds of football games or, you know, or, or, or coming home, drinking a 12 pack of beer and watching, you know, uh, uh, you know, NBC yeah. is not going to make you a successful entrepreneur. You got to take all that time and allocate it to your business mm-hmm. and you got to do it after hours until you have enough money saved up to go pro. Yeah. Couldn't agree more, man. I mean, I get asked a lot of questions from people who say, well, I don't want to share my idea because what if someone steals it? I'm like, man, good luck to them if they steal it because they've got to invest the next two to three years of their lives at least, making probably way less than what they're currently making, trying to make your dream a reality. So, yeah, 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 it's crazy. It's just like the Facebook, the movie, The Social Network, when he says, well, we created Facebook, the Winkle Voss brothers. Yeah. And uh, and I, you know, I know all these guys and, and then Mark says, I created Facebook. You created shit, right? Yeah. Um, so whether you're on the Wink of Us brother's side or Mark's side, Mark put in the work. And as a result of that, he's been rewarded and he still puts in the work. And that's why I admire him so much. And, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, uh you know, you got to put in the work. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you said, ideas are a dime a dozen execution is all that matters. And execution requires you to be brave mm-hmm. and you to take action. And so the reason why a person, I have no fear about giving you an idea because if I love that idea, I've got an army of people to execute on it. Yeah. I give ideas all the time to my friends and other companies and I love nothing more than to see them take those ideas and put them to work. Like I feel, I feel like, wow, like you executed on my idea and you got a result. Fantastic. Right. Yeah. Go. 
Yeah. If I really want to execute an idea, I won't tell you about it. I'll just execute on it. Mm-hmm. Right? So the very act of the person saying, well, I'm afraid someone's going to steal my idea. Well, then you should be afraid of you not taking action on your idea is what you should be afraid of. Yeah. Yeah. It's about the work. And I know you've said this in your book. I don't believe your own hype. The moment you start celebrating, you've left the stage. It wasn't celebration that made you a rock star. It was hard yeah. work. And the same goes with Zuckerberg. Um, you know, you mentioned him a few times and he has built this multi-billion dollar company, one of the biggest companies of our time, arguably top 10 on the um, soon, Fortune soon 500. Soon to be the biggest. Yeah, yeah soon to yeah, be, soon the biggest, be the biggest, right? But he's not resting on his laurels. He's still this humble guy who gets on stage in a t-shirt and jeans and he's constantly looking at what's next, whether it's bringing Wi-Fi to developing economies, parts of Africa and parts yeah. of Asia, or whether it's the next AI engine and whatever it is, he's always looking forward. It's not about, all right, we've got this social network now that people are using and paying us tons of money on ads. It's not what it's about. It's about what's next. Yeah, on, and I got to tell you, that I found a video of him the other day uh, that was when he was, I think it was 2004, and he and I were in communication because I was writing uh, software in the social media space at that time, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and so I, I you know, I, I, I looked at this video in 2004 prior to Facebook going uh, public, meaning you had to have a university ID to get in, and, and he didn't know what Facebook was going to be. Mm-hmm. He just said, I got something here, and I'm going to run with it for as long as I can, now he knows what it is. That's why he could fly hot air balloons over Africa and bring internet service to people, right? Yeah. But you don't know what your business is going to be when you start it. You just have a, you kind of know, kind of, you think you know what it is, but then you get going, you iterate, you pivot, exactly. you find yourself, your resolve, your values, your focus, and then you learn like why you're on this planet and what your purpose is. And then you get to do things like we've done at Vaisalis. And I've given millions of meals to kids in need. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and, and it's easy to do that now that I have resources. But until you have resources, you have to be resourceful. And you have to grind it out and never give up, never tap out until you get the job done. And then once you get you know, revenue starting and you get momentum starting and you get profit starting, mm-hmm. then allocate those profits and things that, you know, that, can, that better humanity and if you follow that, uh, you know, the Facebook formula on that or the Google formula on that or, you know, Bill Gates's formula on that, you're going to become successful and you're going to make a lot of change on the planet. And that's why I love the subject of entrepreneurship. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't agree more, man. Um, look, we are running out of time. If you, yeah. got, if you got another 10 minutes or so. Or... Yeah, sure. Fantastic, I man. Do. Look, I wanted to uh, touch on the well, man in the glass, the Dale Brown story. So many people yeah. might not know that you're um, an executive producer of this award-winning documentary about the legendary LSU basketball coach. What can you tell us about how this came about and what the experience was like? Yeah, so um, I love writing and I love documentary film. I've, I've been a part of a few uh, documentaries. Mm-hmm. Uh, man in the Glass. Uh, I wrote a piece of software called Path Connect. The idea was when, when because my path connected with the mentors. I became successful and I thought, how could I give back to the humanity is I'll write a piece of software that helps people connect their paths to mentors. The software didn't really work out too well. It was, it was a little too early mm-hmm. and I took the technology and I applied it elsewhere. But one of the things I did get out of the Path Connect uh, platform was an introduction to Dale Brown, a ball boy named G.J. Reynolds had wanted to connect to his uh, past mentor, Dale Brown. Mm-hmm. He had saw him when he was 12. Uh, it pinged Dale Brown because we use an algorithm that would, you know, basically index the web and find the person and, you know, try to connect the, the mentee with the mentor Mm -hmm. and Dale Brown met the guy and I facilitated the meeting and, uh, I became good friends with him and he's been like a father to me ever since. Uh, once again, it goes back to like, when you do good, you know, the world will conspire to, to help you. I did executive produce this documentary. I also produced uh, nothing to lose. My documentary, which is free on uh, YouTube, which has won awards as well. I've produced uh, a number of other documentaries that I've been a part of, and I- I'm working on a bunch more. Fantastic, man. Look, we are running out of time, so let's just jump yeah. right into our lightning round. Are you ready to rock and okay. roll? Okay. Let's do I'm this. I'm ready. <laughs> okay, question one is, and I know you're an entrepreneur, but if you had to work for another company and you could pick any company in the world at any stage of their life cycle, who would it be and why? Uh, frag mob because uh, my protege Jay Charles is about to to kill it and change the world with that product and uh, it's rare that I go work for another individual yeah. Jay's a superstar engineer I go work for him tomorrow if I had to awesome love it love it uh, question two is if you could ask anyone a question dead or alive who would it be and what would you ask uh, anyone a question right, I'm going to remove spiritual people from that because mm-hmm. let's just let's just go I, I, if I could ask anyone a question dead or alive who would it be I, 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 right now in my head, I'd be in front of Abraham Lincoln and mm-hmm. I would just say, you know, how did you defy the odds? Uh, you know, how do you deal with, you know, how do you, how do you lead by values when you're in the middle of hell? 
yeah. which is what our political society is right now. Yeah, yeah, well, that's <laughs> very, very apt. Right? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's crazy, man. Brexit and Trump last week. And, yeah, you know, for- yeah, like, I, so I go, if I could go hunt down somebody who talks about this, it'd be Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, awesome, man. <laughs> love it. And lucky last is I love to uh, deep dive. <laughs> is, that, is that the right word? Dive deep, yeah. deep dive into the minds of um, high performers, man. So I ask everyone, what rituals or routines do you have to um, stay on top of your game? Yeah, uh, time to yourself, number one. I try to take three hours a day minimum. Uh, what, if you have an art, any art that you love to do, uh, do it. If it's drawing, draw. If it's, for me, it's writing, I write. Uh, also, work while you work out. If you can't get a workout in, just you know, get on a treadmill and get back to your emails. Uh, figure out a way to go on a hike, as I do with everybody that comes you know, through my property in, in the Hollywood Hills. Uh, I, I take my employees on hikes, work while you work out. Uh, the other life hack that I'd have is, you know, just constantly, constantly try to get simplify your life, Mm -hmm. seek simplicity. When you hear complexity, try to remove it, get it out of your life. Cause I have what's called decision fatigue, Mm -hmm. which means I have to make so many decisions that anybody who wants to ask me another question, I want to kill sometimes, right? It's like, (laughs) are you kidding me? Like I'm trying to make a decision that's allocating, you know, hundred million in capital somewhere. Mm -hmm. And you want to know you know, why I have two pairs of shoes that are the same exact color. Well, here's why, because I don't want to make a shoe decision today. I want to just wear the same damn shoes every day that are comfortable and go for it. So just reduce the amount of decisions that you have to make in your life. So you can, so you can focus on making quality decisions that actually have a long-term impact. Mm. Yes. Uh, uh, Yeah. No, go go for it, man. Yeah. I I was going to say, that's probably it. You know, uh, you gotta, you know, you gotta be a student. Um, and then I guess the last item I'd say is, I get this a lot. People are like, well, I'm depressed. I'm at a rock bottom moment. And I understand that. I've been there. You know, I, I, I've been there per- personally, professionally, relationship. My mother's on hospice right now. I don't know how many mm. days I got from her. I got a son with autism. So when I hear people, they talk about the rock bottom moments. I'm going to give you a quick tip. When you're in a hole, you quit digging. And the way you do that is you stop thinking about the pain that you're in and you go into action and you yeah. stop yourself from thinking about or feeling the pain and you go into action and you open up new compartments Anytime you're thinking about the pain, you got to you got to shut that compartment out and you got to move into the compartment of action because the only thing that's going to get you out of a hole is fast and urgent and courageous action. Mm -hmm. And so I've been there a hundred times in my life. You know, the recession hit me hard. You know, I made some stupid mistakes, uh, you know, after I sold Sky Pipeline. You know, I've I've had all kinds of challenges that have been you know brought upon me by losing loved ones. Mm -hmm. And I've had challenges I brought upon myself. And the way you get out of a hole is you quit digging and you compartmentalize your emotions. You're supposed to feel, you know, feel deeply for the compartmental, uh, you know, for the time you have that compartment open. Yeah. But you got to learn to close that compartment and get back to work because otherwise you'll just be in pain all day long. Yeah. And that's, you, you can't get out of a hole in pain. Well, that's it, man. I mean, it's yes, we notice the, the negativity, but we need, they need to take action. And I think early on in our chat, you said people need to see obstacle as an opportunity. So whatever it is, yeah. perception is everything. Yeah. So I, I'll tell you with this Trump thing, all my friends are liberals uh, and, mm. and, and you know, Democrats in California. And people are like, oh, my God, what's going to happen? And to me, you know, listen, I, I'm not a huge uh, fan of his. Uh, I know him. You know, I hope he does great, but I have no control over that. So only mm. focus on the things you can control, yeah. which is you right now, and go to mm. work, right? Because it's your, it is the biggest opportunity. Brexit is the biggest opportunity for people. There's going to be people. There's going to be a lot of billionaires made as a result of Brexit, mm-hmm. and there's going to be a lot of people who lose billions as a result. Which side are you going to be on? All right? You know, the same with Trump. There's going to be billionaires made as a result of Trump, and there's going to be billionaires that lose uh, as a result of Trump, right? So what are you going to do? Exactly. Take action, accumulate as much resources as you possibly can, and then hopefully one day you can spend the rest of your life giving back with those resources, with the same intentionality and the same desire and the same intelligence it took to earn them in the first place. Love it, man. Love it. Look, I'm going to definitely add um, all, of, uh, all of the links you mentioned to the Can't show wait. notes for our listeners. Um, is there any, any closing words of wisdom, Ryan? Not that you uh, haven't given you know, us enough already. I, I hope uh, what, I guess the only thing I'd say as a teacher, the only way I know that uh, I've done a good job is if the students give me evidence. So if you're out there in the audience and there's a tip that sticks with you or, you, you know, you put it in action, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, that's, you know, that's why I do this type of stuff is I love to be able to share what I've learned. But what I love the most is when I share it, seeing somebody take action on it. So mm-hmm. if you're out there taking action, I'd love to hear from you. Awesome. So RyanBlair.com and on Twitter, you are at? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm at Ryan Blair on Twitter, at Ryan Blair uh, on Facebook, and then uh, on Instagram, I'm at Ryan Vaisalas. Fantastic. Thanks so much for giving up some awesome. time, Ryan. Yeah, thank you, guys. I appreciate you, Steve, and uh, I can't wait to hear from you uh, in the future. Cheers. Hey, guys. It's Steve again. If you're picking up what we're putting down, we'd love it if you took just a minute of your time to like, share, or subscribe to Future Squared on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. It would mean a hell of a lot to the team here who work effortlessly to bring you thought leaders and experts on topics of corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-improvement on a weekly basis. As always, you can find more resources on innovation, um, including blogs, books, podcasts, videos, webinars, and tools at www.collectivecamp.us. If you'd like to connect with me on Twitter, you can do so at Steve Golovesky. That's G-L-A-V-E-S-K-I. Until next time, keep innovating. Future Squared out.